Here we're going to look at two groups of planes in the microscope, which are particularly important in the understanding of color illumination. These are known as conjugate planes, the word conjugate meaning linked together. And they're linked together because they're images one of another. The most obvious pair of such planes is the object on the stage and the final image of the microscope which occurs on the retina of the eyeball. Those two are conjugate planes. There are two series of planes in the microscope. One containing the object and its images, namely the things you actually want to see, and the other series containing the things you positively do not want to see, namely the structure of the filament of the lamp, for example, and one or two other things on the way up to the specimen. I'm going to demonstrate this on this older microscope because it's particularly adaptable for this sort of thing. It enables me to take parts off easily like that. I can remove the viewing tube there. I can take the objective lens off like that. And down in the condenser, I've fitted a number of other little devices for the purpose of demonstration. Put this back, the objective back on now. And the first thing we can show you is the primary image, which is the first image formed directly by the objective and it's projected simply up to around this level here. In the complete microscope, the primary image it lies 10 millimeters down inside the microscope tube. So that we can see the primary image, let us take off the viewing tube, turn the microscope lamp up high, take a piece of thin paper and turn out the room lights so that now we can pick up the primary image here projected up into space simply by the objective lens alone. You can now see that this image here is conjugate with the specimen which on the stage which I'm now moving. So here we have the two fundamental planes, the specimen itself and the first image, the primary image formed towards the top of the microscope tube. If I take off the objective lens from the microscope and put the thin paper in the specimen plane, we can now see that there is an image of this diaphragm on the base of the microscope on the specimen. This diaphragm down on the base is known as the illuminated field diaphragm because it's the diaphragm which determines how much of the field is illuminated. And it's imaged onto the specimen by the condenser lens. So now we have three conjugate planes. We have the illuminated field diaphragm on the base of the microscope. We have the specimen on the stage the objective back and the primary image plane. Here then in the primary image we can see the illuminated field diaphragm opening and closing and we can see the specimen. So those three planes, illuminated field diaphragm, specimen and primary image are the first three in a set of planes which we call the field set of planes because it includes the field of view. Here we'll put the tube back on the microscope and put a piece of thin paper across the top of the tube and here 
you will see not only an image of the specimen itself, but also of the illuminated field diaphragm there, which you can see opening and closing, illuminating a larger or a smaller area of specimen. As you can clearly see, it's called the illuminated field diaphragm because it determines how much of the field is illuminated. It has a particularly important function because just watch what happens to the image, particularly at the edges, as I open it wider. There you see an unpleasant loss of contrast, particularly at the edges of the image, but even all over to some extent. There you can see the loss of contrast. Close the diaphragm down so that its image is within the diameter of the tube of the microscope and the image improves. I'll do it just once again. Open it too wide. You see a ring of hazy light around the edge. Now, to explain that, I always say to students that here I am actually cheating, but it's an educational cheat, so I continue to do it. If I take the tracing paper off and you see what happens when I open the diaphragm wide, you can see reflections from the inside of the tube. The reason why it's cheating is that that part of the tube in there is normally occupied by the eyepiece and it is shiny metal and the lower parts of the tube inside are painted matte black. So this really is a considerable exaggeration of the normal situation. But it is only an exaggeration, it's not entirely false. The reason why you should set your illuminated field diaphragm so that you are only illuminating the area you're looking at is to avoid getting stray light mixed up with your image, stray light reflecting from parts of the microscope inside, which may not be completely well light trapped. We have then, th so far, three planes, the illuminated field diaphragm on the base of the microscope, the specimen on the stage, the primary image 10 millimeters down the tube. And in order to see that, I shall put an eyepiece in, and it's an eyepiece where I've put the letters PI in the primary image plane to mark with the primary image plane. In order that we can see that, I shall put on a ping pong ball, which I've converted into an eyeball by attaching a lens on the front. So here we have my ping pong eyeball with the illuminated field diaphragm imaged on its retina, the specimen, the letters PI in the primary image plane, and they're all imaged on the retina. So to summarize, the field set of planes consists of the illuminated field diaphragm, the specimen, the primary image, and the retina of the observer's eye, or, or the final photographic sensor, depending on the system. Illuminated field diaphragm, specimen, primary image, and retina. We'll now have a look at the other set of planes in the microscope, the set of planes that begins with the filament of the lamp and works through several other planes that we haven't yet mentioned in the microscope. This microscope has its illuminating system built into the base, and if we turn it over carefully, we can have a look at that. The lamp is inserted into the back, and you can see its filament here, and then there's the lamp collector lens here, which 
focuses an image of the filament through the base of the microscope via this 45 degree reflector and up the axis of the microscope where we shall look for it again in a moment. An image of the filament of the lamp is formed in the first focal plane of the condenser of the microscope. So that we can see that, I shall take the condenser off like that and put a piece of paper in its place. And on this paper, you can see an image of the filament of the lamp. In the first focal plane of the condenser, there's an adjustable iris diaphragm. And it's onto that diaphragm that the image of the lamp filament is thrown. This diaphragm here will act as the illuminating aperture diaphragm. Here we have the objective taken off the microscope and you'll see that it's fitted into an adapter here which has a slot in it and into that slot just for the moment I'm going to put a ground glass screen so that I can see an image of whatever is thrown into the back focal plane. If we point this out of the window at infinity, you'll be able to see that we receive an image on here of the world outside, an inverted image on the ground glass. This plane here, the back focal plane of the objective, is where parallel light entering the objective lens is brought to a focus. Here we have the objective lens with its ground glass in the back focal plane looking out of the window at the road outside and here you will see a car driving along in the image so that you can see that in the back focal plane of the objective where I have this piece of ground glass we get an image of distant objects, an image of infinity this is the plane where parallel light is brought to a focus. Here we have a view of the microscope with the viewing tube removed and we're looking directly down at the back focal plane of the objective. I have the piece of ground glass inserted into the back focal plane as a screen and on that screen, you can see an image of the filament of the lamp. This plane has also the illuminating aperture diaphragm, the iris diaphragm we saw just a moment ago in the condenser. And so for the purpose of demonstration, we shall mark that plane by putting a piece of woven material, a piece of gauze in there, a net. So now we have the real filament in its proper position. We have a piece of net in the first focal plane of the condenser. And I'm going to take the ground glass out of the back focal plane of the objective and replace it with a blue cross. We've now reassembled the microscope with its viewing tube and eyepiece and I'm going to look for the final plane above the eyepiece. Here you can see that we go through focus. We've got a large fuzzy patch of light there and below there. And in between we can find a focus where we can see the blue cross which I put into the back focal plane of the objective. We can see the net, the gauze, that's in the first focal plane of the condenser. And lying behind all of that, we can see the image of the filament. So these are all four members of the aperture set of planes, the set of planes that contains things that we don't actually want to see, but are obviously important to imaging. Beginning with the filament, then the first focal plane of the condenser, which is where the illuminating aperture diaphragm lies. 
the back focal plane of the objective, and this position here above the eyepiece, which is known as the exit pupil of the eyepiece. It's where you place the pupil of your eye so that the exit pupil of the microscope can coincide with the entrance pupil of the eye. And here, using a magnifier, you can see a clearer view of the exit pupil of the microscope with the blue cross in the back focal plane of the objective, the woven material in the first focal plane of the condenser, and the filament of the lamp lying behind it all. So these experiments have demonstrated the two sets of conjugate planes that are present in the microscope simultaneously. There's the illuminated field diaphragm on the base of the microscope that determines the area of specimen illuminated. That diaphragm is imaged by the condenser lens onto the specimen. Then the specimen is imaged by the objective lens into the primary image plane of the microscope. And then the image is observed via the eyepiece by the eyeball the final image appearing on the retina. So the field set of conjugate planes consists of the illuminated field diaphragm, the specimen, the primary image, and the observer's retina. Simultaneously present in the microscope with that set, but quite invisible in that set, is the filament of the lamp, the first focal plane of the condenser, where the condenser diaphragm goes. The condenser diaphragm functions as the illuminating aperture diaphragm. The back focal plane of the objective and the exit pupil of the eyepiece, just above the eyepiece. Related to our looking at the conjugate planes is the answer to a question often asked by students, and that is, what do the microscope diaphragms do? Well, the answer to that is that they lie in very distinct planes. The illuminated field diaphragm in a field plane, the illuminating aperture diaphragm in an aperture plane. And to show you the effect of these diaphragms, and how separate they are, I've got here a block of milky glass. In that block, you can see that the light is coming up from below in the form of a cone, coming up from the condenser lens in the form of a cone. It then comes to a focus and diverges again to an inverted cone. If you look first at the bottom, where the cone of the light coming up comes to a focus, I shall alter the diameter of the illuminated field diaphragm, and you should see that that little stalk, that little connection between the bottom cone and the upper inverted cone is changing in size. It's, in fact, a side view, but if it were to be seen on top, it would be changing in diameter. We're altering the diameter of the field of view by opening and closing the illuminated field diaphragm. And all this time, you notice, this has had no effect on the angle of illumination, the angle of the cone of light as it comes up from the condenser. I'll now leave the illuminated field diaphragm alone and go to the illuminating aperture diaphragm in the condenser. And you see that as I close that down, so that alters the angle of the light in, as it passes up from the condenser through the specimen and diverges again above. The important point here is that we are able to adjust these two diaphragms 
to suit the values of the objectives in use. The illuminated field diaphragm needs to be changed according to the magnification because it regulates how much of the specimen is lit up and the illuminating aperture diaphragm needs to be changed according to the numerical aperture of the objective. So these two diaphragms are absolutely distinct, lying in different planes. The illuminated field diaphragm to be adjusted according to the magnification of the objective and the illuminating aperture diaphragm in the condenser to be adjusted according to the objective's numerical aperture. In 1873, Ernst Abba published his theory of the microscope, which stated, amongst other things, that the smallest distance that could be resolved by a microscope was related to the wavelength of the radiation, the light, and the numerical aperture of the objective. This had the consequence that there was a limit to the smallness of detail that could be seen with a microscope. In order to demonstrate that this was true, Abba devised a series of experiments, and I've assembled this special microscope here to demonstrate some of Abba's experiments and a few others as well. I fitted the microscope with two video cameras. The one on the top here receives directly the primary image projected up from the specimen by the objective lens, straight up here and via a reflector at the top. The second video camera here, via a beam splitter here, receives information from the back focal plane. The back focal plane is imaged by a lens I fitted into here, onto the sensor of the second camera, so that simultaneously we can look at the diffraction pattern which occurs in the back focal plane and the image which results from that diffraction pattern. These two video signals are passed into a box of electronics here and they can be combined to appear on one screen on the video monitor. The experiments are done with a special slide which carries a series of fine gratings finely spaced lines and other features which can be used to produce a diffraction pattern. This particular slide was produced by Zeiss in the 1960s and functionally it follows the design of the slide that Abba produced back in the 1870s. The slide then goes on the stage. The objective lens that we use is fitted into a special device with a slot here which coincides with the back focal plane of this particular objective, which has a magnification of 6.3 and a numerical aperture of 0 0.2. I have a series of devices that will fit into there, which enable us to mask off parts of the diffraction pattern so that we can deduce the functions of those parts of the diffraction pattern. And most particularly, I have a small iris diaphragm here, which enables us to alter the numerical aperture of the objective, the effective numerical aperture of the objective, and see the effect of reducing aperture on resolution of fine detail. I shall now fit the objective lens back to the microscope, and we'll be able to begin the experiments. Here we have an introduction to the experiments. It partly serves as a reminder of conjugate planes in the microscope, and partly it's also just a little bit of fun. The microscope is fitted with two video cameras, and the outputs of these are presented on the one screen, such that the back focal plane of the objective is imaged at the top of the screen, and the final image plane 
at the bottom and I'm able to wipe between the two views emphasizing more of one and less of the other and vice versa as appropriate. I've made a little mini picture of ABBA which I've put into the back focal plane of the objective and I have a small picture of the Carl Zeiss logo. When we look at Ernst Abba, we don't see any of the Carl Zeiss lettering superimposed on him, nor when we go to the Carl Zeiss logo do we see any of Abba's whiskers. You notice though that behind Abba, because he is in the back focal plane, you can see the filament of the lamp, which is imaged there according to the uh, requirements of curlier illumination and the filament being imaged into the back focal plane of the objective does not and cannot appear imaged in the final image plane which we're seeing at the bottom. ABBA, I said, I had put into the back focal plane of the objective, but you see here that his name must be somewhere else. I've put that into a plane conjugate with the back focal plane of the objective, namely the first focal plane of the condenser, the plane where we have normally the illuminating aperture diaphragm. Then I said that Carl Zeiss was on the stage, but you note also that Jena is somewhere else. Jena is positioned close to the illuminated field diaphragm and therefore imaged onto the specimen, another reminder of conjugate planes. In putting this apparatus together, I thought that Abba, the scientist, would particularly prefer to be placed into the back focal plane, since a lot of the study of the back focal plane um, derived from his work. And I rather suppose that Carl Zeiss would be very happy to be found in the image plane of an advanced microscope with um, extremely high performance. So, having introduced the two halves of the screen, let us now move on to the experiments, remove these special parts and have a look at the diffraction system. Now we'll move on to the experiments themselves which centre about the diffraction slide. So I'll pick this up and put it onto the microscope. And there on the screen we see the pattern that is on the slide. We have a fine grating at the top of the screen with a spacing of 8 micrometres and a coarser grating at the bottom with a spacing of 16 micrometres. I can bring in the diffraction pattern at the top of the screen. In the first focal plane of the condenser, we have a pinhole. I can move that pinhole a little bit to the left and to the right, and you can see the image of it up at the top of the screen. You see also that if we just move to one of these gratings, say the fine one, we get a very nice diffraction pattern at the top of the screen. Repeat images of this pinhole here. We can be calling this the zero order beam, the first order beam, and the second order diffracted beam of this particular specimen. Notice that the longer wavelength, red, is diffracted through a greater distance, a greater angle than the shorter green and even shorter blue wavelengths. If I bring back the coarse grating like that, you'll see that the spacing of the diffracted spots is now closer together. So you see that there's an inverse relationship between the spacings in the object and the spacings in the diffraction pattern. Wide spaced object, close spaced spots in the diffraction pattern, close spaced objects, wider spaced spots in the diffraction pattern. 
We'll now have a look at the effect of changing objective aperture on resolution and I shall do that with the little iris diaphragm which I can put into the back focal plane. So I shall put that into the slot in the objective like that and to show you I can take away the pinhole and look at the back focal plane of the objective and there you can see that the iris diaphragm there is lying in that same plane. I'll put the pinhole back there and check for concentricity. Just a tiny adjustment there. And then we can bring in the final image plane like that. And now we're ready to look at the effect of changing objective aperture. What I'm going to do is close down the diaphragm in the back focal plane so that first it removes the diffracted beams from the fine grating and then as I proceed further it will remove the diffracted beams from the coarse grating, simply leaving the zero order. So let us now have a look at the effect of that. I shall find both gratings here, like this, and close down the objective aperture, and notice that we've lost resolution in the fine gratings first, and now we've lost great resolution in the course as well. As I open up the aperture of the objective, first the course gratings resolution comes back and you'll see that that on the top of the screen has coincided with the return of the diffracted beams, the first order diffracted beams from the course grating and then the fine grating comes back and again, you can see that that coincides with the return of its diffracted beams. To make that clearer, if I move it so that we only have the fine grating in the field there, so we have the diffracted, it's just the first order diffracted beams of the fine grating, you can see here very clearly that if we remove the diffracted beams, leaving simply the zero order, we see no fine detail in the image. I often do a silly experiment here. I simply take the slide off the stage where we have a zero order and no information in the bottom of the screen in, in the final image. Put the slide back, the diffracted beams reappear and the lines in the image reappear. So there you see the effect of varying the objective aperture on resolution. And the larger the aperture, the finer the detail can be seen. We'll now have a look at the effect of wavelength of the illumination on resolution. Here I've got a filter carrying two colors, green and red. And I can put that in the light path here, green and then red, and maybe turn the light up a little bit. I'll, you, you notice that it's in the plane of the illuminated field diaphragm, so it's possible to see both colors illuminating simultaneously, green in one part of the field, red in the other. What I shall do is close down the diaphragm in the objective lens, reducing the aperture, so that virtually no red diffracted light can enter the system. Let's touch that up a little there. So now you see that we're not resolving in the fine grating. I shall move that to the green part of the filter and immediately you'll see we do resolve. And the reason why is obvious, that some 
green diffracted light for, of the first order is squeezing through that carefully adjusted opening, whereas the, that opening is not sufficiently large to accommodate the more widely diffracted red light. So there you see the grating not resolved in red, resolved in green, and if I go to the junction between the two colours in the filter, you'll see simultaneously that we have resolution in the green, but not in the red. So earlier we saw the influence of objective aperture on resolving power. Here we see the influence of wavelength on resolving power. And in fact, they're both parts of the same thing. It, they're both to do with whether we can get diffracted beams through the aperture of the objective, either because of the size of the aperture of the objective, or for a given size, the angle through which the light has been diffracted when it arrives at the back focal plane of the objective. We'll now return to the more normal situation. I'll take the color filter out, open up the diaphragm in the objective, and put, for the moment, both gratings in position. Here we have quite an array of diffracted beams. Probably you'll be able to see even more if I remove the diaphragm. We've got the zero order, we've got the first order of the course, we've got the first order of the fine and the second order of the course, we've got the third order of the course, we've got the fourth order of the course and the second order of the fine, and so on. Do we need all those beams in order to resolve? Let's explore. I shall put the diaphragm back in like that. And let's do the exploration simply with the fine grating for simplicity. And I'm going to close down the diaphragm a little bit. In putting it in, I've already partly removed the second order of the fine grating. But if I close it down just that little bit more, now we are building an image and a resolved image too with the zero and two first order beams from this fine grating. Do we need them both? We clearly need some of them because if we just allow the zero order in, we're not resolving. But if I slide the diaphragm sideways like that, we can see that if we simply include one diffracted beam, and the zero order beam, we are resolving. So we didn't need them both. Do we need those two beams? Clearly we need the diffracted beam because that we've already seen is the information. But if we simply include the one beam, the diffracted beam, first order beam there, we're not resolving. Wonder what about the second order beam? Now, here we have the first and second order beams of the fine grating and no zero order, and we are resolving. Yes, the image looks a bit different, and we'll come back to the reason for that difference in a minute, but we are perfectly well able to resolve those lines. So it looks as if we need two beams. In this case, we've got the first and the second orders on one side, or we can have the zero and the first order. We need at least two beams because, as we'll see later on, the final image is due to the interference between two diffracted beams, be it the zero order and the first, or the first and the second order, or the whole array of beams, depending on the situation. The practical conclusion we can draw from this, of course, is that we should use light of the shortest reasonable wavelength, green light, for example, rather than red. And this matter is taken to the extreme with an electron microscope, where the, radiation, where the wavelength of the radiation 
is something like a hundred thousand times shorter than that of light, offering considerable scope for improvement. While we're demonstrating the effect of objective aperture on resolving power, there is a small point which has a practical consequence which may be worth pointing out. Here I'm going to close down the diaphragm in the objective lens so that we lose resolution in the fine detail. In fact, I might as well move the specimen so that we only have the fine grating present. We've lost resolution in the fine grating and you can see that the diffracted beams from the fine grating are just being excluded by closing the iris diaphragm in the back focal plane. We've lost resolution in the fine detail. I'm now going to move the pinhole in the first focal plane of the condenser to one side of the condenser aperture or to the other side of the condenser aperture and you notice in both cases resolution reappears because we've included a first order diffracted beam in addition to the zero order. Here with the zero order coming directly up the axis of the microscope, we're trying to accept a first order beam on the left and on the right, and the result is that we're accepting neither. If we move the zero order beam across to one side, we can now include one diffracted beam, the one on the left or the one on the right, and you see that that is adequate for resolution. This has a lesson for practical use of the microscope that you should not use your condenser diaphragm, your illuminating aperture diaphragm, closed down too small or you will not resolve the finest of detail. I can possibly demonstrate that by turning the light down because I'm going to take the pinhole away and moving to a larger aperture in the condenser and here now you see resolution has returned. So far we've been looking at experiments which demonstrate the importance of aperture and wavelength I have a few more experiments here which demonstrate the importance of the diffraction pattern for the final image and show that if we manipulate the diffraction pattern, we can in fact manipulate the image that we see of our specimen. Let's start with this one here where we have a sort of chessboard of features on the slide and if we look at the diffraction pattern, we see that we get a two-dimensional diffraction pattern. It repeats not only left and right, as did the pattern from our lines, but also up and down, because, of course, the repeat of the specimen is in both directions. I have a slit, which I can insert into the back focal plane there, so that we are selecting out just one row of those spots in the back focal plane. And if we look at the image, we will see that we have an image of vertical lines. We must have an image of a series of vertical lines from a diffraction pattern like that, even though the true image is a series of little spots in a chessboard arrangement. But if we select out only part of the diffraction pattern, we manipulate the image so that we see only the image that derives from that part of the diffraction pattern from which we're building the image. And as you might 
possibly guess, as I rotate this, so, uh, selecting different parts of the diffraction pattern, for example here, a vertical column of diffracted beams, a vertical column of diffracted beams gives us, as you see, a series of horizontal lines. I'll now go back to the grating that we started with, this one here, and square it up and include both coarse and fine. And here I have a device which I'm going to insert. And I'll show you what it's like by removing the pinhole. And you'll see that it might be considered to be three slits, or within those three slits you might say it's two opaque bars. If I put the pinhole in, you'll see that it's arranged so that the zero order beam passes through the central slit and the opaque bars block off the first order beams from the coarse grating and the lateral slits allow through the first order beams from the fine grating and also the second order beams of the course. You'll go to the slide like that, look at the image. And when I insert this device, you'll see that now in the region which was formerly coarse grating, the lines are all now closely spaced together. We've converted the coarse grating into fine. We've done it by converting the diffraction pattern that relates to the coarse part of the image into a diffraction pattern which is almost identical to that of the fine grating. I say almost identical because there isn't as much energy in second order beams as there is in first. And so since here we're using second order beams to cancel out by interference the zero order beam and the second order beams are rather weak and we're getting incomplete blacking out of the zero order so we're ending up with grey lines. There we've blocked off the first orders of the coarse grating, permitting only the second orders through. The relevant matter for determining spacing in an image is the spacing in the diffraction pattern and the beams contributing to this image are spaced between the zero order and the one here, the second order of the course or the first order of the fine and that distance gives rise to what we've been calling the fine grating spacing. I can now do something as an extension of that by putting in a similar device but which has the central slit blocked off now we have twice the spacing in the diffracted beams that are available to build the image from. And so when we go to the image, we find now we have lines of twice the frequency or half the spacing again. So here we have our conventional fine and coarse. With the central slit open, we can make 
them fine everywhere. With the device with the central slit blocked off, we get super fine lines. None of that is of any practical value, but it's an important lesson in demonstrating the relationship between the image and the diffraction pattern, that you get the image which depends on the diffraction pattern from which you build the image. And if you manipulate the diffraction pattern so that it is not the normal one, then you end up with a, an abnormal image. Many specimens, such as the one we've got on the screen here, have their own inherent contrast or have been stained to provide contrast. But many others, important ones too, such as living cells, have little or no inherent contrast and they need some form of optical technique to make their component parts visible. Here we're going to show you two relatively simple and readily available contrast techniques which enable us to see content of living cells. This is dark ground, or dark field as it's sometimes called, and phase contrast. We'll now have a look at the function of the zero order beam. So in order to do that, I'll take out the iris diaphragm from the back focal plane and put a little device into the back focal plane in its place, a tiny little opaque spot, a completely empty background with a small opaque spot in the center. And I shall put that into the back focal plane. I'll cover up the image for the moment, put it into the back focal plane and you'll see that it will go in and obscure the image of the pinhole of illumination as it comes up from the condenser. I need to make it concentric for the best effect. So I'll be able to pull it out like this and then pop it in and block off the zero order beam. So let us now return to the image and see the effect of putting in this little stop to block off the zero order. There. I'll take it out, put it in again. You notice that we now have bright lines, or dark lines in the normal image, bright lines in this image when the zero order is removed. This is a dark field image, an image to which the zero order beam has been prevented from contributing. An image built simply from the diffracted beams. If we add the zero order to those diffracted beams, we get dark lines. It appears that the presence of the zero order is converting these bright lines into dark lines. presumably by interference. The diffracted beams provide brightness in the positions of the lines. If I remove the slide, the zero order provides light all over the field. If we have the zero order light together with the diffracted light, if we have two lots of light in the positions of the lines, the zero order plus the diffracted light, we then get destructive interference between the two and the lines appear black. Of course, in practice, we don't do dark field by inserting a little spot into the back focal plane of the objective, we do it another way. Let us take the spot 
out of the back focal plane. And you see now we're still illuminating with a pinhole. I'm going, though, to put the stop, the spot, in the centre of the first focal plane of the condenser, effectively illuminating with a ring of light. And you can see now that the diffraction pattern is displaced rings of light instead of displaced images of a pinhole. So now we're illuminating with a ring of light, but this ring of light is getting into the objective. Because the ring of light is getting into the edges of the aperture of the objective, we're obviously not going to get a dark field image. But I can put in the iris diaphragm and use that to cut off the ring of light from the edge of the objective. And by adjusting that, we can get ourselves a very nice dark field image. So that demonstrates that the, the size of the spot that you may use in the condenser to achieve a dark ground image has to match the aperture of the objective lens. Of course, we don't commonly use dark ground for slides which already are as contrasty as this particular one, where we have dark black lines against a clear background. It's much more commonly used to provide contrast in otherwise not very contrasty specimens. And on this slide, I do have another kind of grating which displays rather low contrast, as you see. It consists of vertical stripes of material of slightly different optical path, different thickness or different refractive index on the slide. You'll see that it does produce a diffraction pattern, rather a weak one with the zero order quite a bit stronger than the first order beams. But nonetheless, there is a diffraction pattern there, and there is very little visible contrast. But if I put in the dark ground stop, straight away you see a considerable increase in contrast, and we have now a much more usable image. Remove the device, no contrast, put it in, high contrast. So there is dark field achieved by blocking the contribution of the zero order beam, the unscattered light, blocking the contribution of that to the image. Here we're doing it by obscuring it in the back focal plane of the objective. That's rather an unusual way of doing it. Here we can put the ring of light into position and you see that as it reaches the edge of the aperture of the objective, it falls outside the aperture of the objective, yet, of course, it's still falling on the specimen. If we have a look at the image and increase the illumination, you'll see now that having moved that ring into position, we have a good dark ground image. Shift it out of register and we lose contrast, bring it in and we see contrast again. There we have a, a dark ground, dark field image produced by blocking off the center of the aperture of the condenser. This is a common way of doing it using a device called a patch stop which can be built into the condenser or can be even homemade. The other method of contrast enhancement that I'm going to show you here is phase contrast. And this relies on the fact, the fact that's rather difficult to explain, that the 
diffracted light caused by the interaction of the beam with the specimen is a quarter of a wavelength retarded behind the undiffracted zero order beam. As I said, this is difficult to explain with, without a lot of mathematics and diagrams, so please accept that the specimen retards the diffracted light by a quarter of a wavelength with respect to the undiffracted light. Phase contrast is done by treating the scattered light, the diffracted light, and the undiffracted light separately and differently in the back focal plane of the objective. And it's done by some kind of a device which selectively can modify one or the other lots of light. In this case, we have a little spot looking superficially very like the dark ground spot we used a moment ago. I'm going to put that into the back focal plane of the objective, like that. And there it is. And you'll see this time the spot is not completely opaque. You can see it coming in like the eclipse, but yet once it's in, we can see through it. It's transparent. It's slightly absorbing, but it ha has another particular property that light that passes through this spot which I'm inserting travels a slightly different distance from light which travels through its surroundings. So let's bring up the specimen. There is the specimen in focus with very little contrast. I shall now push in this little stop and immediately we get beautiful contrast. This is phase contrast. If I remove the spot, we lose contrast, put it in, we achieve high contrast. Out, right field, put it in, phase contrast. This is a relatively simple system compared with more expensive devices and it's extremely useful in increasing contrast of, for example, living cells. Here we're doing it in the way of a demonstration using, as you see, a pinhole of illumination and a phase contrast pinhole, a little spot which treats the zero order unscattered light which is passing up the center differently from its surroundings. In fact, the optical path of the light passing through the center, where the zero order goes, is one quarter of a wavelength different from the light that passes through the surroundings. This means that the specimen itself has applied one quarter of a wavelength phase difference between the diffracted light and the undiffracted light. And when we put the device in, we add another quarter of a wavelength, so giving us half a wavelength, such that when one wave is positive, the other wave now is half a wavelength out of that, namely is negative in correspondence with the positive peak of the other lot of light, and so these two beams will cancel each other out and by interference and give us dark contrast. This was done with the demonstration pinhole of illumination and with a pinhole of phase contrast area in the back focal plane. Much more usually it's done by illuminating with a ring of light. We saw a ring a moment ago for dark field. Well, this is a smaller ring which falls within the aperture of the objective. And conventional phase contrast is done nowadays with a ring 
in the back focal plane of the objective. The one in the first focal plane of the condenser that you see imaged there is called the illuminating annulus, annulus being a little ring, and the device that goes into the back focal plane of the objective is called a phase plate, and on it is the phase ring. I'm going to put that into the objective slot so that it goes into the back focal plane there. You can see it going in, and we need to do a little adjustment to get it precisely into register so that all of this bright zero order light passes through the phase ring, which is optically just a tiny bit thinner than its surroundings so that the light that passes up through the surroundings, which is the scattered light, the diffracted light, passes through the slightly thicker bit. The specimen already provided one quarter of a wavelength phase difference between the light, the undiffracted light and the diffracted light. This device is now providing a second quarter, giving us half a wavelength, giving us interference. And here, when I get it into focus, we see a contrast, the phase contrast image. People often ask at this stage whether this is a true image or whether it's an artifact. Well, I think it's maybe an artifact, but it's one that we can understand and draw useful conclusions from. And in any case, a true image of an invisible object is presumably an invisible image, and that's doing us no good at all. So I don't think we ought to worry about whether the phase contrast image is truly true. It has been enormously useful in the study of living cells over the past 50 years, but I haven't commented that white light has a range of wavelengths from rather short blue light to rather long wave red light. Our eyes are not particularly sensitive to blue or to red. Our eyes are most sensitive to green light, which lies in the center of the visible spectrum. And most usually, phase contrast objectives are made to work best when using a green filter. It doesn't make a very great amount of difference, but if you want phase contrast to work at its very best, then it, it can be helpful to use monochromatic green light. I've said several times that the final image is due to interference between the various diffracted beams, and I have an experiment here which might tend to confirm that. Instead of illuminating with a pinhole, I have here a slit, a vertical slit in the condenser, the first focal plane of the condenser. I also have another slit, which I can put into the back focal plane of the objective, and I'm going to put it in so that it's perpendicular to the slit in the condenser. So the slit in the first focal plane of the condenser is vertical. The one in the back focal plane of the objective is horizontal. That diffraction pattern looks fairly similar to the one we've been seeing all along with the pinhole, ex except simply that the beams are square. And we get our series of vertical lines as before. I'm going to do a very simple thing, but it has a surprising effect. I'm simply going to twist the slit in the back focal plane of the objective while leaving the slit in the first focal plane of the condenser alone, and we'll see what it does to the image. I'm going to twist the slit in the objective and we've lost resolution. 
Switch it back to square and resolution comes back. Turn it the other way. We've lost resolution again. This is surprising because we appear to have a full set of beams. We've got the zero order in the center. We've got the first order of the fine grating to the left. We've got the first order of the fine grating just off the top of the screen. We've got at least three good beams, but they're not resolving. They're presumably not in a position to interfere, whereas when they're square on, they are. And we can add to that by twisting the slit in the objective and now rotating the specimen a little. And when we get the repeat direction of the lines on the slide, in the same direction as the slit in the objective, now we do resolve again. Turn the slit back to square and we've lost it. Turn the slide back to square and resolve it. Resolution comes back. This may seem to be a rather difficult one to understand, but to me, it's a very good indicator that the final image is the result of interference. In the normal situation, where we have the slit in the objective lens in the same direction as the repeat of the lines in the object, then we get light from this position of the source, the filament, being imaged to the left by diffraction and to the right. And all these diffracted beams are originating from the same part of the source, and so they're coherent. If we twist the slit in the objective lens so that we're sampling the diffracted beams from different levels, then here we have the zero order, the first order has actually been diffracted to the right from down here. The second order from lower down again. The first order to the left has been diffracted from up here, and so on. They've all been diffracted from different parts of the source. So they're not coherent, and being not coherent, they're not in a position to interfere and give us the lines. By twisting the stage so that the repeat direction of the features on the slide is in the same direction as the slit, once again we bring resolution back because light from this part of the source is now being diffracted in this direction. And so these here are all coherent and do interfere. To me, that's the most convincing evidence that the final image is the result of interference between the set of diffracted beams. Now I'm going to take you on a journey through the microscope from the back focal plane with the diffraction pattern up to the image plane to show you how the diffraction pattern converts into an image. I can do that because when I built this equipment, I fitted a bellows here before the camera which picks up the back focal plane so that I can alter the distance of the camera from the objective lens. So moving from an aperture plane into an image plane by turning this knob. We don't need to look at the image plane there, so I shall get rid of that. And now, if we watch the diffraction pattern, as I turn this and I'm moving the camera 
towards an image plane and you see that the diffracted spots are going out of focus, they're coming closer together, they're shortly to overlap and as we proceed like this we'll begin to see the image appearing in the center and as we proceed a little further we've almost got the image in focus as there I think that's a little bit too far there so there's the image now we'll go back in the reverse direction increasing the distance going towards the diffraction plane the image has broken down into its series of component diffracted beams there